What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen. Today, my friend Claire Marie Lim joins the podcast. She is a Singapore-born music technologist, electronic musician. She produces and performs under the name Daltrick, and she's an educator, certified trainer with Bitwig, Ableton, and Apple. She also is a professor at Berkeley College of Music. She also teaches for the certified training centers uh, 343 Labs and Beat Drop. And she's a big advocate of women and Asian representation in the music industry with music technology. Claire's just a super nice person. She's got a lot of energy. I was excited to have her on the podcast. And we talk about a lot of good things. We talk about her live setup, her vocal chain for her, her live performance. We talk about what it's like being an Ableton certified trainer in today's world. We talk about her favorite MIDI controllers and a lot of other really good things that you could probably take home and chew on. So yeah, today's a good episode. Got a lot of good stuff for you guys. Before we jump in, want to give a big shout out to the sponsor Melodics for supporting this episode. We love them. If you haven't checked out Melodics, go to Melodics.com. That's M-E-L-O-D-I-C-S dot com. And it's a desktop app you can download, plug in almost any MIDI controller and practice your skills playing keys, finger drumming. You can even plug in an electronic drum set if you have one and grow your skills and just become awesome at playing drums. And it's just a good way to gamify your practicing, have fun while doing it. Sometimes it gets real depressing in a dark studio when you're practicing by yourself. And now you can always have fun while practicing. So definitely check it out, Melodics.com. There's a free trial. There's lots of genres and lessons you can practice with. If you want to join the subscription, save that piggy bank. Use the discount code LPO-20. That's LPO-20. Last but not least, if you don't own the latest version of Ableton Live 11 standard or suite, I'm happy to hook you up with a major discount and you don't want to miss that. So go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. That's liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. Happy to hook you up. Also, if you want to be the first to get new episodes when they're released here on the podcast, join the newsletter. I'll also send you some other goodies and downloads and other cool latest happenings and webinars and events that I'm doing. Help you grow your skills making music in Ableton. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. And on that website, you can also learn more about my Ableton training membership. Happy to hook you up. I just updated my Live 11 music production course, and it's super cheap. So join the membership. Hope to see you on the other side. Without wasting any more time, let's jump into today's podcast with Claire Marie Lim. Cool. I think I should be okay now. Nice. <laughs> hey, awesome. Nice. How are you? I'm super good. Busy, yeah. but I'm sure you're the same. Yeah, kind of. It's been a little crazy, but just trying to stay alive. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're thankful for that. That's good. Totally. Yeah. That's the objective. Stay alive. Absolutely. Ooh. Are you in New York right now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm in New York at the moment. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. I'm in Indianapolis for the Whoa. time being. We'll see how long that lasts, but Whoa. I was planning to move to LA before the pandemic hit. And then I was like, mm, oh, okay, probably not anymore. Yeah. yeah not, not so much. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah cool. A lot of things changed. Totally. Yeah, last time I saw you was in Laura Escudé's masterclass. Yeah, totally. It wasn't master track. That oh my god, that feels like it was so long ago. I don't think I've seen a lot of people <laughs> since like I know. a year and over ago. But like, oh my yeah. god. Oh. Do you do you still talk to many people from Master Track? Yeah, kind of a little bit. I still talk to Laura every now and then for like like random playback stuff and and everything. Sometimes I get to hang out with uh, Jules a little bit, also just like through some of the online stuff. Yeah. Um, that he does, which is really cool. And a couple of the other folks that, uh, not so much Master Track, I guess, but Transmute, the other program that Laura does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because yeah, I, I TA'd for one of the runs that she did. So sometimes I still um, am in touch with a few of the people who did the program. Nice. But it's been pretty neat. Yeah. How about you? She's busy. Like, it's insane. I don't know how <laughs> just so many things. I'm just like over here trying to yeah. stay alive. <laughs> but. She does a lot. She probably built some kind of time traveling machine we don't know about. I She's know. like secretly using it to take <laughs> over the world. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Laura. She's been on the podcast twice now. Yeah. Cool. For anybody listening, if you want to go back and check her out, she's great. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, oh wait, we started recording already. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we're in it. Oh, we just jumped straight in it. <laughs> That's awesome. Should should I like redo the intro? Hi everyone, great to no, be here. No, no, this is this is the most laid back podcast. You try to keep awesome. it that way. Cool. Thanks for having me though. It's great to see you again. Yeah, totally. It's been a minute, and um, I've been following you on all the socials and everything, and seeing the occasional live streams you've been having cool, over the last year. Uh, some good stuff. I feel like Thanks. you produce a lot of different styles of music. Yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's it's at this stage for for most of my artist project that I do like the doll trick stuff. It's kind of just whatever I want to make, um, right. which is which is good. I think which that's a cool. part of the reason why. Yeah, it's kind of the reason why I didn't want to keep that separate in the first place. Anyway, I think mm -hmm. um, just because I I used to do a little bit of music um, or like artistic stuff under my own name like many many years ago, and I always felt a little bit of pressure to. I don't know, not, not not necessarily make things that people wanted to hear, but always think about maybe like what people would expect me to sure. make. Um, and for my artist project, my main artist project, Doll Trick, now it kind of frees me and takes me a little bit away from that. Yeah. Um, so so I enjoy that a little bit more than I think, you know, trying to worry too much about <laughs> what, right. what other people think I should be making as far as music goes. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I, I agree for myself too. Cause I teach and then I also have Philia in my project yes. as well. Yeah. And it's like, there's that weird balance of like, I want to make music that I'm interested in, but it also has to be like commercially relevant to some extent that other people listen to it. Otherwise, like, you know, I guess it depends oh, on your objective. If you just mm -hmm. want to sit in a dark cave all by yourself, but if you also want to play shows and have an audience, you also have to kind of think about what they would like as well. Yeah, totally. And I think like on, on the notion of like teaching and stuff, um, and it sometimes almost even extends to, I think, my students a little bit because I teach a lot of um, students who are sometimes like at a like, college level where they're really thinking about doing this like super professionally. They want to learn all of the different things. And it's like, yeah. how do I make very specifically like future based music that sounds exactly like Flume? And then I have to kind of like put on the teacher hat totally. and be like, this is exactly how you do that. And then a part of me is like, but I'm not sure if I should be telling you how to do that. Or like sure. encouraging you to explore. So it's it's kind of like a weird balance like that too. I don't know if you've encountered anything like that in your teaching. Yeah, I think it's like stretched me. I think becoming a teacher mm. has made me a better producer by far. Yeah, Because definitely. people ask me questions and I'm like, I have absolutely no idea. So I'll get back to you in like a couple of days. And then totally. I learn in the process. So definitely, I think it's made me a better producer. It's also kind of helped me be introduced to styles of music I wasn't oh, totally. even familiar with before. Like really weird, like uh, what was it? Um, like vampire techno. <laughs> you ever listened oh to that? Oh my god! Okay, I, no, but now I need to. I need to find out about <laughs> yeah, vampire. It's, it's a real genre. It's just like it's it's like something out of the Matrix movie. You know, where they're in that dark club, just like crazy, like Whoa. four on the floor, really dirty. Like yeah, that's it's, cool. It's a whole. It's a real thing. It's like a cult following in Europe. That's crazy. Okay, now I need to research that. the The next, I guess, closest thing I've heard to that was someone mentioned like Norwegian death metal. Yeah, <laughs> I think there's Which some I, crossover actually probably there. Maybe, yeah, maybe there's some kind of like, you know, like Venn diagram where they yeah. meet in the center or something. If it's electronic <laughs> and it has death in it, it's probably of a similar subgenre of vampire totally. techno. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, speaking of teaching, you're still teaching at Berkeley College of Music, right? Yeah, that's correct. How's um, that going? It's been going good. The interesting thing about Berkeley that's, I guess, a little different from other um, higher education institutions is that there are three full semesters a year. So we're still kind of in the middle of that. So usually a lot of schools or colleges in the States will have like fall semester and then they have spring semester and then everyone's on break for summer. Uh, but Berkeley has options for like studying for all of summer. So I'm still teaching <laughs> right yeah. now. Um, and it's, but it's a little bit more chill, like in normal circumstances, people would still go on campus, but it would be a, a shorter semester. So a, a couple of weeks shaved off. Um, but it's still happening remotely now, so that's what's cool. going on. And during the summer, we also have a couple more um, additional programs. One of them is like this um, 12 week and also a five week program that's meant for high school students who are interested in potentially coming to Berkeley, but maybe haven't really decided yet. So it's kind of like their introduction to what um, studying music at a college level would look like. So a little bit involved in, in that too. Yeah. So you're just teaching overtime because you got three semesters a year now, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> And then, kind of, yeah. And you're also, in addition, teaching at 343 Labs. Is that still yeah, happening? Yeah, cool. So I'm, it's interesting because I'm trying to kind of whittle down on 
my activities like in general. So right now at the yeah. moment, I'm mainly focusing on Berkeley, but still, yeah, working with a couple of other places. Um, three four three beat beat drop is another um, yep. Ableton certified training center that I work with. They're that's based in, in Calgary. Canada. Yes, they're right. they're in Canada. Um, and that's been really fun. Um, Gabe. Who um who's actually another Ableton certified trainer also like us? Um, he's the director over there. So so he and I uh, I got to know him like last year when Mitch, who's another Ableton certified trainer, got me on board there. But yeah, less so of that. And most of my time now is really spent a lot on the Berkeley um stuff and also just in, independent stuff that I do outside of that with individual artists as yeah. well. How do you find time to like balance your own creative interests on your own with Daltrick versus like the teaching hat that's oh bringing God. in a lot of the income? <laughs> totally. I wish I knew how I did it, Dan. I don't, <laughs> to yeah. be honest, to be very frank, like I'm still trying to figure this out and I haven't really, uh, I, I've spoken to a couple of people about this like publicly, but um, maybe this is like another instance of me doing it, but it's been really tough on my mental health. Mm. Um, I'm like in the middle of trying to figure out a huge like not breakdown per se but I've been struggling a lot since I guess the since really the pandemic started I feel like because so many live events got taken away and I'm sure you experienced this too like so many of the in-person things were just like totally gone within yeah. um like a second so totally. that that was really hard to make up for in terms of you know other sources of income and even just being able to do stuff I feel really fulfilled by being able to, you know, help people and, mm -hmm. and, you know, make music as well. So really when the pandemic came, it was like getting punched right in the face. And I was lucky enough that, you know, I, I still had other things I was doing, like with the teaching and, and not just the live performance or the live experience design stuff that I was doing for clients. Um, but, but yeah, it, it just kind of made me in a way feel very, um, I guess not, uh, maybe obligated is the wrong word. Maybe it is the right word. Obligated to find like other things to keep myself occupied. Yeah. And I think in doing that, I inadvertently just made myself very, very stressed out. Mm. Um, so even close to like around like November, December of last year, even until January of this year, I was just like really, really stressed. So I started doing a lot of therapy, which has helped. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. my gosh, yeah. like it's it's been really helpful um, with just managing things. And I feel like I'm slowly getting a little bit better with, with just being more like myself before yeah. the pandemic, um, yeah. in a weird sort of way. Like I feel as if this pandemic has, even though it, it stripped away a lot of the opportunities, it kind of introduced other opportunities to take care of myself. <laughs> yeah. it, that, it sounds really weird. I'm sure. Like I, I know no, most not at all. Like, <laughs> no, not at all. I don't think it's weird at all. I totally relate to that on every level. I think a lot of people listening do too. I mean, it was a weird year for everybody, but somebody who's extremely extroverted like yourself, <laughs> like it seems like <laughs> probably, I mean, when you're around people all the time and teaching and interacting and yeah. then you're just kind of forced to being stuck at home in a dark cave, you know, teaching online, it's not the same having yeah, interaction definitely. through Zoom. It's just not the same. Totally. And, and recognizing, I think for any creative it just that you need to take time to have me time and take care of yourself and self care is like something I think that more people are realizing is more important now than ever. Yeah. You know, this last year, especially, you know, totally. and honestly, like for me, I had to really reassess like how I was spending my time and realizing more than ever this last year, that time is worth more than money really. And just recognizing, yeah. you know, like how I'm going to use my time, use it to take care of myself. You know, what are the things I want to be investing my time in, whether it's job related or personal interests? Yeah. So, yeah, I think like as and thank you for sharing that. I feel like we don't talk about it enough. Like I was yeah. talking to, to some of my like this is again going back to the teaching stuff, but I was talking to some of my students um, who were asking me about like, you know, what classes to take? Like, should I take summer? Should I take it off? And and back when I was a student, I, I also went to Berkeley for my undergrad and um, I, I did the semesters back to back, like I did fall, spring, summer, like for all the years that I was there. And if I had a second chance, I'm honestly not sure if I would do that again. Really? Because I think it I think it kind of almost put this idea into my head just to, to keep working and to keep hustling, which is, is sometimes good. Um, and it helps satisfy, like you said, that kind of like extroverted side of me. Um, but there are times, you know, when I've just wanted to be like, introvert I feel like I'm a bit of an extroverted introvert like like yeah. I, I push for a little bit of the outgoing stuff but I think in doing so I took away a lot of the time that I should have spent just being myself like in my head and and 
doing all of that. And honestly, I think that maybe even relates to what you mentioned about the artist stuff. I feel like when I'm in that more introverted, more reflective headspace, I feel like that's where I give the best sort of artistic output. Yeah. So I've been thinking about that a lot totally. too. Like still, <laughs> it's still like a, a thought process that's going through my head so much, but oh, <gasps> yeah, to no, something out. 100%. I mean, if you're in a healthier headspace, it only makes sense that you'd have a better output with results, right? So, I mean, if you totally. are taking, if you're in a good emotional place, you're going to be able to give back to other people more generously. I feel like, cause you have more to give in that capacity. Yeah. Absolutely. In my experience, that's, yeah. yeah, that's what I found out. Do you feel sure. the same thing with, oh, sorry, cut you off. <laughs> no, you're good. I was going to ask if do you feel the same thing for the philia stuff that you do? Like, is that kind of your your space for that? Totally. Yeah. And maybe you can attest to this, but I find a lot of certified trainers I've met, it seems like there's a weird balance where a lot of them, a lot of them become so focused on teaching that they almost neglect making music for themselves. Yeah. Oh my God. That's like... This, and, that's what I'm the most scared of, Dan. <laughs> yeah, no, and I started doing that. I caught myself doing that more this last oh. year during COVID because it was just a finance thing. Yeah. And then I was like, you know what? This is cool. I like teaching. I enjoy that part so I can justify subconsciously doing more of that. But it was almost at my own expense and realizing like, well, you know, actually I might have to cut out teaching and doing as much through my website, live producers that I was before just because I need to do it for myself. And so yeah. even for me, taking that pay cut has been worth it in some ways because I'm like, I'm happier. <laughs> you know, I, totally. get it, I get to have me time and, and feel more like myself when I make more time to do the things I love. So, yeah, no, I think it's you're right. It's the same for a number of the other CTs that I've talked to. I think it's it's like you said, this weird sort of of balance. And in a way, it's both wonderful that wonderful. And I guess in, in that sense, a little bit also exposing that like all of the people who would want to ever like look for a certified trainer have our contact information <laughs> on, the, right. on the internet because it's just like they can reach out anytime right which is True. one thing I'm so grateful for for like Ableton as a company they're so wonderful with all of these opportunities and yeah. like um, the, like the new loop create event thing that's gonna yeah, come out soon I'm excited for that I'm excited for that I'm really curious to see what that looks like yeah totally I actually haven't um looked too deep into it I the only thing I did was I think put my email address down for like mm -hmm. signing up for info and that was it but yeah they've been like really gracious with all of these wonderful opportunities but like totally. you said at, at some point it's just like there's so much <laughs> we need to make right. a decision so i'm still like in the process of of honestly even just beyond the ct stuff like just getting better at saying no mm -hmm. to, to things that that are like that could be good but are maybe not so much worth the cost so a lot sure. of like reevaluation. Of that so it's a work in progress that's it's good totally a work in progress. you're doing good things that's thank good. you <laughs> yeah well i've okay. been enjoying the stuff you've been cranking out online um as far as teaching and just live streams you've been doing a lot a lot of live streams you did a uh, live stream on twitch every day at 6 p.m are you, are you still doing that you're not yeah. still doing that right now so are you i'm taking a quick break now but yeah okay. i did do those um more so last year but yeah for a while it went like super strong like i was just doing that um every day sharing just like little tidbits about music tech. And sometimes I would host episodes of my uh, <laughs> podcast that I used to have. It was called um, all seven it, episodes. Uh, I listened uh, to them. I know. Oh my God, <laughs> Dan, it's so embarrassing. But yeah, like RTFM, read the friendly manual. Yeah. And just because it was, it was actually a, a weird, like half joke sort of thing that um, I, I was talking about with one of the other certified trainers. I think, no, actually it was Ben Casey. Um, oh, yeah. from, from Ableton. I, I was love talking, Ben. Yeah, I love Ben so much. Um, but yeah, I was talking to Ben like a long time ago about, hey, are there any like audiobook versions of the live manual? <laughs> and and I was, and he said, no. So I said, okay, maybe I should like record a little bit. And it's also yeah. a little bit more of the, this again kind of goes back to the education stuff too. But um, I used to work very closely with a student who was brilliant and um, he was visually impaired or he had a visual impairment and it but one thing that was awesome about the setup that we made for him is that he had push and he was able to basically use this color coding system to make music just with push without looking at the computer That's <laughs> which so is cool. like which is really great and That's awesome. um, he's yeah he's making wonderful music now which is it was such a joy to work with him like and and he was only like 13 which is <laughs> crazy wow um so making lots of really wonderful stuff but yeah and he would often say like you no, know, his ears were really a lot stronger mm -hmm. um, than any of his other senses. So being able to like listen to me explain stuff, that was really big for him. 
um, and helped him a lot. So I was like, hey, maybe there's other people who might use something like that. So totally. the, my grander like idea, and this is maybe like for years down the road or something, is if anyone from Ableton is listening and if they want an audiobook, I can do the audiobook for That's the cool. Ableton reference manual or something. But yeah. yeah, so that was how the weird podcast got started. And um, it's on pause as the other general streaming is. But it was fun while it lasted. <laughs> yeah, no, it was cool. It was a great concept. I loved it. <laughs> Thank I you. think that's so fascinating what you said about the guy who was blind that you were mm-hmm. teaching. Um, and that's, I don't know, it's really, it's so interesting. When somebody loses one of their senses completely, oftentimes they actually uh, enhance their other senses. Like yeah. one of their other senses becomes way more enhanced, which is just yeah. fascinating to me. Totally. I don't know, I think and it's really interesting. Yeah, it, it's definitely fascinating. I was recently talking to another of my my colleagues and they were saying that another way that they have encountered Um, music education for people with um, visual impairments is through the use of feeling like a lot of tactile stuff like with how sound Mm -hmm. waves you know you can feel it transmitted through a piece of material Mm -hmm. so they were trying to explore that a lot and I need to recall the exact source of um, the research but there was definitely a lot of work being put into looking into those things as options for learning music Um, so very interesting things that are kind of going on in that field of education yeah no, that's a whole different world. I would love to learn more about that. Totally. That's really cool. You um, you also are certified not only in Ableton, but you're certified in uh, Apple and Bitwig. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Do you ever use oh, Bitwig God. still? Is that still I a thing? I do. It is. Bitwig version four just came out. Yay! I'm so All happy. Right. Um, but it's been it's been cool. Um, it's it, I actually got certified for Bitwig first before I got certified for anything else. Um, really. Okay. And yeah, my my journey with Bitwig is, I, I don't think I've actually talked to many people about this, but I started learning about it around the same time as I actually started learning live. And hmm. I think the main reason I did was because at the time when I first started learning live, I was in college. And one thing that I was doing a lot with um, just music and electronics in general was using modular synths. And at the time, there wasn't really super smooth implementation for that with live, uh, but Bitwig had it. So I was like, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one thing that can be used. And um, and I think like this is something that is kind of like an unsaid secret, but the folks who developed Bitwig used to previously be, be with Ableton. So yeah, it, kind no, of has that a little, was, mm-hmm. it has definitely a crossover. They look oh, a lot alike. It's pretty obvious. And it was, um, I think it was, what was it Placidus Shelbert? I'm probably butchering his name. He was the CEO of Bitwig, but he was the international sales manager at Ableton. Oh, interesting. That part I didn't know. I'm not sure of like the personnel, but that's cool. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's a little bit of a connection, both in Berlin, Mm -hmm. bunch of similarities, but yeah, so I I started learning Bitwig first um, before live. And then eventually, of course, we started getting, you know, CV tools in live to be able to work with modulars and stuff. But so I kind of had this parallel growth of sorts. Um, and then eventually I, I started, you know, looking into to certification because I had used it so much. So I got certified for Bitwig first before getting certified um, with the Ableton folks. But it, it was great. I've, I've, I've always been using um, some of their tools more for like anything that deals with hardware just because it's implemented in such a smooth way. Mm-hmm. And starting from Bitwig version 3, there was this feature called the grid that came into play. Um, and the grid's really cool. It's kind of like a built-in Max for Live environment without needing a separate Max for Live thing. <laughs> so okay. it's almost like it's its own um, modular environment that you can use to build your own synths, build your own um, like modules, devices within Bitwig. So that's been really fun for me. And I've actually used that more often than not to teach folks about synthesis. This was kind of even before cool. the uh, Learning Synths website from the Ableton folks got yeah. into, into like the public eye. So it's still kind of like there <laughs> for me. A lot Did of you ever the time. use um, Ocelot from Ooh. Ableton? Yeah, I, I think it's called Ocelot. It was Ooh. like a really dumbed down version of like creating your own modules and like synthesis inside oh, of, cool. it was like a dumbed down Max for Live device. Nice. I need to look into that. How do you spell that? Ocelot? Like, is it Ocelate? Like, I have Ocelate? to look it up. Yeah, it's like Ocelate. It's O S C I L L O T. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Yay. Yeah, yeah. By Max for Cats, I guess. Very was the cool. developer for that. Um, but then Bangle was another cool one. I don't know if you ever played with oh, Bangle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's cool. That's a fun Very patch cool. modular synth that came out a while ago. Totally. 
do you use modular since, since we're on the topic? Uh, a little bit. I no, like it's been one of those gateway drugs I've been avoiding for a while, but don't, yeah. <laughs> I'm wanting to get into it. Like I've just been kind of dipping my toes into it as far as the hardware totally. side. I've done a lot mm-hmm. of like mod stuff with like, you know, software, but as far as yeah. the hardware side, I have a sub 37, which is obviously not a patch mod. Ooh. Um, but I've, I've learned a lot of synthesis from that since I bought it years ago. Yeah, that's awesome. What you said about the gateway drug thing, though, is totally true, Dan. Some, mm-hmm. One of my mentors told me that like Eurorack, which is like the the format that the modules are in, is really just Eurocrack. <laughs> it's like the Euro moment crack. You, yeah, you start it using it. It's just like, and it's it's totally endless with like finances and being able to like get different oh, yeah. stuff. One of my best friends who's into modular since he's always telling me about how he's like, selling stuff, buying stuff, reselling stuff so that he can buy more stuff. And it's just like super crazy. But yeah, I I honestly don't have a modular system yet. So at the moment, I work mainly with semi-modular stuff. So I have like a a shelf over there. But my my main baby as a modular is the O-Coast or the Zero Coast or the No Coast. There's like so many names for it Um, by by Make Noise. So it's really cool. It's like a little unit. um, Oh, yeah. You do a lot of the packing too. Yeah. Like 600 bucks. Yeah, it's a really good kind of like entry point thing. I've had it for years at, at this point and it's been, it's been nice just as like a sound source for some alternate sound design stuff. So that's a part of like, um, you know, my other color palette um, options yeah. for music. So that's been really cute. fun. Yeah, it's really, it's small. It's, it's like this tiny little thing. Yeah, it's it very, cool. it's clear sized. It's good. <laughs> it's fun sized. Yes, it is. So that's so been a really has, good option. So yeah. it's what, two oscillators? Um... Honestly, I'm not super sure. The way that it's, I think it is two oscillators. Most of the time, like the make noise stuff, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with make noise stuff, but they yeah, tend to, yeah, they tend to like have really interesting visual interfaces. And I almost like that you're not super sure always 100% what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Like you end up patching different things, getting really cool stuff. I've probably done a lot of terrible things to my my no coast that probably shouldn't have been done to it, but the sounds that come out are cool. So like, I'm not complaining at that point. I feel like there's no (laughs) rules with modular synthesis and that's why it's fun. Totally. You just tweak stuff until you find happy accidents. And I think like the options just end up becoming endless because there are so many, you know, different little things that you can do. And are you by Mm -hmm. any chance familiar with VCV rack? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. VCV racks dope. Yes, yeah. so good, and and it's it's free, so it's like all of those totally. Modules. That's a great way for people who want to like jump into modular synthesis and just totally. really go deep into it. Yeah. At this point, I think I've pretended that I've had like lots of different racks <laughs> that yeah. I would want to have in real life, but it's okay for now. They all exist in the virtual, and I'm happy with that. So that's okay. <laughs> yeah, and awesome. they have it on Linux too. I just realized that that's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's and that's also another reason to get Bitwig. If anyone's listening, it runs on Linux too. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, I'm definitely a Mac person. But totally. Yeah, I, I'm a Mac person too. So totally get it. Yeah. So you do a lot of performance stuff. Like that's kind of your niche. I feel like you really came up with like setting Thank up you. a live performance as a solo artist. You'll jump around from your push. You have a great voice, by the way. You'll do a lot of Thank singing, oh, God. <laughs> a lot of weird effects like vocoding and all that mm-hmm. fun stuff. Um, maybe we could just nerd out for a little bit for maybe people who are new to you. Yeah. Um, like you just explain maybe your live setup. Like what does that look like? Yeah, totally. Um, as far as my live setup goes, it's, it's almost a little like fluid 100% of the time. But like, I love using just different combinations of controllers. I was joking with someone else also that I guess if I were a superhero, my superhero name would be like Controller Woman or something like that. Controller. <laughs> just you, like, need a, you need a nice cape. I know, a cape and like, I don't know, like a headpiece or something like Wanda yeah. from WandaVision or, or whatever. <laughs> that was a great like, show, by the way. I just finished I the entire, oh I watched the whole thing in one day. Oh, good. I love ridiculous. the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's like another another thing. And also oh. like the the soundtrack, like the all of the theme songs for each of the the shows that came up, it was like in a, a different genre for like a, each of the, the TV series for the sitcoms. But anyway, that show was great. Uh, it's a great yeah, show. I mean, that, that's going to be my superhero outfit. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, so I like different conf- configurations. I would say like if I did have to choose, say, one thing, like one controller that I use the most often, I would probably say it is push. I think it's been kind of like that all in one little unit or not so little unit. Actually, I've been trying to subtly hint or not so subtly hint to to some folks at Ableton, like if they ever made a push mini, it would totally be <laughs> my thing. Just because oh, like, yeah. I'm not like such a, a, not an extremely large person 
So when I go on gigs, sometimes I have to really think about what I'm bringing. Um, so so I, I usually have like the, the headset and the mic and the wireless set that I usually use for vocals or processing or, or flute and stuff like that. Um, and then at least one controller. If I can only bring one, then I usually tend to bring push. But otherwise, um, I love going, going through other controllers. One of my second favorites um, or top two other favorites, I guess, um, would be the Keith McMillan Instruments Q-Neo and the Sensil Morph. Yeah, yeah, I've seen you like, rock the Sensil a few times. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that one's really one of my my favorite ones just because of the the portability overall. Shout out to the Sensil people if they're listening. Yeah, um, Sensil's so a great but, company. They yeah, make really awesome. interesting controllers. Totally. And, and I just like the idea of, you know, things that are maybe a little bit more expressive than we might usually get from a standard sort of MIDI controller. Uh, like mm. I used to, my, my dynamic duo used to be, I guess, the push and also the Akai MPK mini, which is like, you know, a very popular controller by Akai, super small, 25 keys, works great. Has yep, the knobs, I have one the next pads. to me right now. I yeah. Love it. It's like, it's like that one power thing that you get. Mine's like right over there. So I used to bring that a lot, but then when I discovered the, the morph, um, because you can switch out a bunch of different lay uh, overlays, you can kind of change its function on the fly. And that was really useful for me too. So that kind totally. of surpassed it a little bit, but I still use the MPK mini almost as like a, a good, reliable demo thing that you can always refer to. Yeah. The morph. Yeah, this Amazing. thing is real interesting. Yeah. The morph, um, because like you were saying, you can just drop any kind of pad on it. Like it's yeah. just like this flat surface for anybody watching the video mm. right now. We're like looking at it. It's so yeah. tiny. The technology is brilliant because you can literally drop any layout of any pad on top of this flat surface and it just automatically connects and then you can just map it. Like I actually really haven't dove deep into one. How easy is it to just have it like pre-mapped and able so to- So easy, Dan. Yeah, it's so good. You're going to love it. I, I hope you explore more. It's really fun. And and the great thing about it too is that it's Bluetooth operated. So you can actually do oh. a lot of wireless stuff with it. If you if you charge it, you do need to charge it up. And I've, I, w I have had a little bit of trouble with that sometimes, but if it's charged, um, it'll last for, I think, a couple hours and you can just use it wirelessly. But yeah, it's That's really cool. easy. I think the way that um, it detects and, and it, I'm not super sure about this. So someone may have to cross check me, but I think the way that it works is in each of the overlays, like the little pieces, there are magnets built into the back of it. That when okay. you put it on the on the that panel thing, it automatically detects. So it's kind of able to okay. say like, oh, I recognize this pattern of magnets or this like set of the sequence of magnets or something sure. like that. And that is able to like say, oh, okay, this is the specific piano overlay, or it's the um, music production overlay, which has more of the faders and sliders and knobs and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah super easy stuff to configure. And and the fun part about it too is, um, it's pressure sensitive. So it does MPE, which yeah, is Yeah, I was just awesome. going to say that too. Yeah, that was one of the first really popular ones that was like MPE enabled. Yeah, totally. I think like it's been a really good um, alternative and I guess also like a competitor in some ways with like the Roly stuff. Do you use the Roly stuff? I have. I went to Gearfest at Sweetwater mm. like two years ago and did a like a deep dive with a rep. Um, we just like nerded out on the rolly and awesome. I liked it, but I didn't, it wasn't as simple plug in and play as they made it seem right away. Um, I totally. feel like you have to configure it and tweak it a little bit to actually get comfortable with it. Even for piano players. Like I have a pianist that like is brilliant. He grew up playing jazz his whole life and he struggled it with it a little bit. Cause he had to kind of get used to yeah. you know, how like the notes really are. So like just zero to, totally. to the next note, it's just like really smooth. Yeah, to be honest, it was kind of the same for me too. Um, because I, I was a classically trained pianist, so I kind of grew up with that as like my first instrument. And even just getting used to a little like I, I love the early stuff. I still use it every now and then, but position wise, it's really hard to get used to the idea of like the moment you move your finger, even in the slightest, it's gonna get detuned. Right. So for for a second when I started like really playing Roly stuff um, on the seaboard specifically, which is the, the keyboard one. It was just so hard to wrap my head around like the moment you press on it, you cannot move your finger yeah. or else it's going to start bending the pitch. So yeah, yeah, so I had a little bit of difficulty with that, a bit, little bit less so with the sensor. So maybe that's why I'm, I'm a little bit more leaning towards that. Sorry, Roly friends. Sorry. Yeah, we still make great stuff. We're not hating on you. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Hey, friendly reminder, go check out that desktop app I've been talking about, Melodics. Go to Melodics.com. There's a free trial. You can try it without any commitments, and it's a great way just to practice your skills and have fun while doing it. Um, it's like a better version of Guitar Hero or Rock Band. 
that you can actually apply playing keys or finger drumming, playing electronic drums. They have a huge lesson variety with a lot of different genres that you can practice with. So really encourage you to check that out. Use the discount code LPO-20. That's LPO-20 if you decide to join the subscription plan. Otherwise, check out that free trial and back to today's episode. Um, so back to like your life setup a little bit. So you Ooh. have, say, your Sensel, um, you love your push, and then you mentioned your Akai and PK, I think mm-hmm. you said. And then um, as far as like your vocal processing, what does that normally look like? Because you do a yeah. lot of singing with like your wireless mic. Totally. The singing stuff, it's it's a little weird because at this stage, I almost feel like like I'd never been trained in singing. So I was just, oh, really? it just kind of like inadvertently happened. I was like, I want to sing some stuff, so I'll do it. So I ended up, hey, ended worked up out. doing it. Sounds yeah, good. Thank you. It kind of, it, it did. Um, But yeah, I try to keep my chain honestly pretty simple. And maybe it's just because I remember in the very early days that I was um performing a lot with, with live, there was one time where I, for some reason, I kept having these like random CPU spikes, I think when I was using a lot of processing stuff. So nowadays, I just try to keep it as simple as possible. And for the most part, it seemed to work. So the vocal chain at the moment, if I can recall, what it usually ends up being is I have a I, I start off with a waves tuner that's set up in in chromatic and it's set, set fairly like gentle. So because I don't really like a lot of aggressive tuning so i just try to yeah. like practice as much as possible make sure that i'm staying in the right key <laughs> like just practice first seem ma- make sure that it's you know good um and that you don't need to be too aggressive with the tuning i know some people who would prefer to have heavier tuning i i tend to shy a little bit away from it just because i'm not a super big fan of the color of of like okay. really aggressive auto tunes but i have a wave tuner almost for like a little bit of safety and then i have and that's actually the only thing that is an a third party plugin in live. Everything else is just stock stuff. So I have I have EQ8, um, yeah. I have compressor after that. And sometimes I'll have a second compressor just for a little bit more gentle, like um, series of compression stuff going on. So very often it's the waves tuner, it's EQ8, compressor, and either a second compressor or glue compressor. And then it's an effect chain of like eight macros that I have that's usually mapped to just one of the generic controllers that I own. So sometimes it's on the, oftentimes it's on the Korg uh, nano control too that I have, which is just like a bunch of faders and knobs, but it's eight effects that are, are now kind of like my, my stock ones. So I have a beat repeat, a distortion, high pass filter, low pass filter, phaser, delay, reverb, and our classic fade to gray one knob thing. Yes. I call <laughs> that gray. like, yeah, fade to gray for the win. That's, I call that my oh shit knob. If I mess yeah, up, I just no, like, oh, totally. just, <laughs> just throw it in there. Yeah, yeah, totally. And honestly, like I like the one knobs a lot. That was honestly how I learned a lot of what it meant to build a rack. Like yeah. I, I was just such a fan of how when, especially when I first started learning live, how some of the presets you can just like open up like what's going on and look under mm-hmm. the hood. It's a little bit like the Max for Life stuff in, in some sense, but really just more so for seeing what people's philosophy is behind the construction of effect racks. And yeah. and I remember just like opening up all of the audio effect racks and looking into, okay, this is what they're mapping to this macro. And mm-hmm. then they're changing the maximum and minimum of those things. So I, I liked yeah. a lot of, of how that was structured. And I learned so much from that process of being nosy <laughs> and poking yeah. around. Yeah, totally. Whenever I get like a new plugin, I'll always just open up the presets and I'll just like click through the presets and then first of all, I'll see how that sounds, but then I'll go in and kind yeah. of look at the control positions and see, Absolutely. okay, well, how did they get this? And same thing applies, I think, for Ableton's presets as well, or anybody new to live learning racks and especially the audio effect rack. I mean, there's some yeah. really cool presets in there too. Totally. Do you have any favorites on your end? Uh, I built a lot of my own that I use mm. now. But back in the day, there was the DJ Master one. I Ooh. would play with that sometimes. <laughs> um, I think I have to like pull up live to actually really remember. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a couple others. I think they're really fun. I think they added a, definitely some new ones with Live 11. Totally. Uh, do you have any favorite new effects that you like with Live 11? Yeah, I, I'm so biased. The new spectral effects. I love them so yeah, much. Yeah, spectral resonators are <laughs> so amazing. Nice. Oh my God. The, just like the way that they were. I think I remember watching like the very first announcement video or something when those got when those came out but i was just like mesmerized by how they sounded and i think to be honest like i'm a little bit biased too because it works kind of similarly to a vocoder and kind of gets you a little bit of similar colors and i love vocoders 
Um, mm-hmm. like, like you mentioned, you, you brought up just now, I like doing a lot of weird sorts of vocal, vocal, vocoder stuff. Totally. So spectral resonator and spectral time to, to some extent reminded me of that. So I was like, just really enamored with the both of them. My only qualm is, I guess, also similarly to like hybrid reverb, which is the other device that I've been liking a lot. That's new of Live Yes, 11. hybrid reverb is really cool. So good, but the CPU stuff, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it makes me want to cry. No, it does um, eat it up. I, mean, I think it depends on the setting too with hybrid totally. reverb. Um, yeah. But you're right. Like it does get, it does become a little intensive, especially yeah. if you, especially I find like if you're playing with the, it's either convolution or the algorithmic. I think it might be the convolution. I'm not super sure. Or maybe it's both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it may to boost the CPU a little bit. But there's some really cool convolution presets in there. Like the default one, the Ableton Studio um, mid, yeah. I think sounds really, really good. Totally. It's been really nice. I think also just offering as more like sound designing options. Oftentimes mm-hmm. I found that like when I'm using those, especially if it's not so much in a live setting, but maybe just even for like noodling around in the studio or working on different ideas, like I'll just use them, freeze, flatten, and then that's it. They go away. <laughs> yeah. It's like just as yeah. a sound design kind of tool and then like not touching them so that my CPU like isn't dying or, or something like that. That's something Wait. I wish I would have told myself like years ago to do more of. Like if I could go back in time and give myself advice, it's just to freeze and flatten more things. Because not only does it like yeah. obviously make your computer smile and happier, but it also forces you to commit to moving forward, you know, because if you have MIDI and you have all these plugins and a big chain you've built out, then it's so much easier to go back there and just get lost in tweaking yeah. land. You're just like tweaking the same thing over and over. But if you just commit to it, then you're like, well, there's the audio. We're moving yeah, on. You know, totally. Just throw another that, EQ if you need yeah. to. <laughs> always the EQ, like always EQ and compression for like every always. single thing. Yeah. But yeah, like, I mean, to that point about like just committing to stuff, I feel like it's that was honestly one of the main reasons why for a long time and and to some extent still now, like I would never only just use live for production. So I would have this workflow, like if I was making my own music, I would either produce in live or logic. And then if I needed to mix anything, I didn't want to keep like poking around with everything else inside the software. So I would end up like bouncing everything down and mixing in Pro Tools <laughs> instead. Oh, okay. But nowadays I've actually started doing a lot more of the committing just like on the fly as I go with production stuff. So recently I, I released a couple of songs that yes, they were like totally ju- just done in live alone with that as like the only software, the only DAW without yeah. using like other DAWs. And I think I, I can kind of see like that becoming a workflow. So maybe I'm slowly getting away from Pro Tools for yeah. production, but still using it for, for if I mix for other folks. So, but but yeah, it's it's played a part in kind of affecting my own workflow too, just as an artist overall, like freezing, flattening, not touching it anymore because I can't do anything about it. So it's just like there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. Are there any other like plugins outside of Ableton that like are your go-tos that you really love using? Totally. I think like my, my go-to, this maybe also connects to the vocal processing stuff, but Isotope Vocal Synth is one oh, yeah. of my babies <laughs> that yeah. I, I love so much. I, I'm a big fan of Vocal Synth uh, 2 and also Stutter Edit 2. Both of them are by Isotope, but I find that they, they satisfy me so much harmonically as well as rhythmically. Um, but yeah, just a big fan of all of the Vocal Synth colors that, that come out. Again, it's also a little CPU heavy, which is yeah. The part that makes me sad. So I usually tend to just use vocal synth to for productions, and then if I need to do a live vocoder, then I'll just use the Ableton Live vocoder um, as like a, a stock plugin. But you know, like I love so many of the colors that come out of vocal synth too. There's just like some magic that comes out of using all of the modules because the the way that it works for maybe folks who aren't so familiar with vocal synth too is that there are five kind of sound sources that you can use and mix together to create different colors of. Uh, vocal synthesis um, textures. Um, so I like using that a lot. And you can get anything from like Imogen Heap stuff to Daft Punk stuff to mm-hmm. Zed t- kinds of sounds too. Yeah. So big fan of vocal synth too. <laughs> oh, for sure. No, it's great. I um, The presets that come with it too are fantastic. Like, yeah, there's totally. a lot of, I've used that a few times. Um, not yeah. even on vocals, but like on bass too. Like yeah. bass synths, I've gotten some weird effects playing with the presets on bass synths too. Totally. Even sometimes like what I, I tried doing um, with vocal synth and also with spectral resonator now that we're talking about it is I've tried to vocode or spectral resonate. I, I guess that's the verb for it. I don't know. Yeah. Spectral resonate drums and it ends up working yeah. really nicely because 
I realized yeah. that the, the, you know, the percussiveness of drums and like capturing all those transients, if you manage to do it with some kind of harmonic context, it sounds really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and it almost gives you like automatic chord patterns without you actually having to do any like MIDI programming. So it's a, it's a fun way of, of doing that too. No, that's, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that on my last track, Crystal Lights that I released is Philia. Ooh. I, one of my favorite effects I've ever made was just running like a trance kick drum. Um, and then I put, I sent that to a return track and I put spectral resonator on that oh. return track. And then I resampled the sound of that coming out of the return track with the dry signal it sounded ridiculous. Oh, nice. It was like a bass. <laughs> it was like a fat bassy 808 fuzz kind of sound. Oh my God. That's awesome. I need to try that. Like it was fun. I, there's so yeah. many things to, to be done with all of the wonderful effects. And honestly, even like some of the, the more, I guess, quote unquote, traditional like updates to live were really great too like the new chorus with the ensemble editions yeah. like i i like you using use that a lot i sometimes i do i tend to use them more on in a production setting like on backing vocals i tend to use um that but the ensemble setting that's been like a new favorite for backing vocals and production stuff yeah so, so definitely that as well and the updated like phaser flanger too like those are great as well so i've been really happy with a lot of the live 11 updates <laughs> that's been really cool yeah, no, for sure. I mean, when Live 11 came out and they added a bunch of extra new effects, I was like, do we really need all these other extra effects? And I played with them and I was like, yes. Yeah, we do. Totally. We need all these. You the mentioned... One... Ooh, go for it. No, go ahead. No, no, no please. Go for I was it. just going to say, you mentioned Stutter Edit and I haven't really played a lot with that, but I know everybody that plays with it loves it. Have you it's ever so used good. Tantra? It's an older plugin. No, I have not. I need to look it it's up It's like now. $69, um, but it's kind of like stutter edit before i think stutter edit was a thing Ooh, cool. um but i love it yeah it, it comes up with some really crazy glitchy splattery arpeggiated effects uh it's by uh ds audio oh yeah i think i found it tantra by uh dimitri dimitri yeah yeah does I, I i sorry if i'm butchering their last name i don't even know how to say it it's fine Ooh, yeah cool. t-a-n-t-r-a that's a really fun plugin very cool. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to look it up like after this. This is cool. Yeah, yeah. You run that through anything, really. It just creates a weird arpeggiated stutter. And it's actually Amazing. pretty user friendly. I mean, for somebody like you, I think you could figure it out pretty quick. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I like I like like random stuff every now and then. I think like the last like random ish type of thing that I poked around in was actually, I guess, more of it was max for life. So not so much like external stuff, but I played around with the probability um probability pack, pack. Yeah. so good i was like so happy about it and i think it was also at a, a general good time for me because i've been trying to explore a little bit more of you know chance in and randomness in music too instead of having like a super structured sort of thing um it's something that i used to do a lot more in in my other artist project that i have that is kind of like a, a little bit rotting away now i need to revive it but it's called cable wrapper <laughs> i used to okay. do more like experimental like techno stuff with that um, so looking a little bit more into that, but yeah, I've been really happy with also more of the probability features that have been in live 11 too. So like the chance and, you know, changing note probability, velocity probability, stuff like that. Yes. So, yay. Yeah, no, 100%. Like I, I've been diving deeper into step sequencers and I'm going to do an episode Ooh. on this podcast on like the best Max for Live devices <gasps> I've found and other nice. ones that other people have been telling me about. Do you have like any other favorite Max for Live devices? Probability Pack is really cool. I yeah, love that. Yeah, Probability Pack is cool. And I'm actually not sure if it's still available, but um, one of my uh, teachers, his name's Matthew Davidson. He's also a professor at Berkeley and he was my teacher back um, in, in college. As an artist, he goes by Stretta, S-T-R-E-T-T-A. Um, okay. But he used to work um, for the folks at Cycling for a number of years. And then he also worked with cool. Motu and he was developing a lot of these wonderful Max for Life stuff. So he had, he has an entire repository of these, I think, but one of them as a sequencer, since you mentioned sequencers, Dan, it's called Mono Sequencer. Oh, I yeah, think, yeah, um, I know that. Yeah, so he made like a bunch of Max for Live devices. Some of them work also with the um, Monum Grid, which is made by the company Monum. And it's kind of that, um, that controller that this artist called Daedalus pop popularized a lot. Um, for a live performance, but um, but yeah, so the Strata suite of Max for Live devices is is one that I use still okay. quite a lot. He has some lots of really really cool stuff just for generating ideas, generating chord progressions, um, also being able to kind of work in a setting where you have an ensemble of of people use stuff. I first started using Matthew's devices a lot when 
I was a student as as a member of his modular synthesizer ensemble. So he created the very first like modular synthesizer ensemble at Berkeley back when oh, I was wow. a student, and and I That's got a chance cool. to be a part of it. It was so cool, and he's an amazing professor, and and it was like one of the funnest times, honestly, that I ever played live music in a group setting. So I'm awesome. super grateful for that, and um, yeah, still reminiscing a lot of the devices that he shared with our class. And I think they're publicly available. They should be, I think, on his GitHub. Yeah, I just saw <laughs> he has a ridiculous list. It's there's, so crazy. He's amazing. <laughs> That's really, I'm going to so cool. go down a dark rabbit hole of looking at all yeah. these later. I hope you like it. It's cool. There's lots of really fun stuff over there. Yeah, no, thanks for the heads up. There was a certified trainer named Mel. Um, yeah, Mel. Melanie oh. Frisoli. Frisoli, yeah. Yeah, she seems really nice. She sent me a link the other day to Mad Step. Yeah. Which is like her sequencer. Uh, It's like an eight step sequencer, but it also has like some really cool things you can lock in. Obviously, the key scale root note has like a lot of randomization and you can control like dotted triplets and different notes and note lengths and syncopated rhythms. It's interesting. Yeah. And she was really nice. She made it available to us. So thank you, Mel, if you're listening. (laughs) Thank you, Melanie. Woo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shout out, Melanie. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you and Daltrick? Do you have any projects, anything planned? Yeah, totally. So I've actually got a new remix coming out on um, the first week of June, which may- maybe after when this will ever. It's coming out in June. It was for a band um, called Coastal Town. So they hit me up to remix one of their tracks that was a little bit more of like an acoustic sort of setting. Um, so it's a remix of their tune called So Innocent. It's going to be out in the first week of June. Awesome. Um, and then, um, so yeah, so really excited for that. Thank you. And then later on in the month, I'm, depending on how this goes, I'm, I'm actually not super sure what the timeline is going to be like, but I was hoping to release one of my other originals under my Daltrick project that is called Destiny. I've been putting it off for a little while, but it was a tune that I wrote initially as part of a timed production challenge, like one of those like beat battles or, or um, like sample challenges and stuff with an organization called She Knows Tech. So they, they focus a lot on uplifting women and um, Who yeah. runs that? Uh, Jasmine uh, Hawk, I think that's her last name. Um, okay. But she's awesome. She's great. Um, and she founded She Knows Tech, and she used to be a, a student at Berkeley in Valencia in Spain in their master's program. And yeah. then she founded the organization um, with, I think, Megan Megan Smith, who's another also alum of that master's program. So Jasmine and Megan run it. They're awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. And, Definitely and, familiar with them. Yeah, totally. And and Jasmine's been so sweet with like inviting me to to help be a part of the community and participate and stuff. So I created that as part of a time challenge that um, she held. Like they call it the Flash Beats Lab. So that happened last year. And then I eventually developed it into a full sort of live performance. So I've been trying cool. to really solidify like the s- studio version of that, <laughs> quote unquote, yeah. just to, to kind of make sure that it's uh, not make sure, but to have some kind of version that I'm really happy about. And that's like, this is the version <laughs> that is the actual song. That's awesome. So well, congrats. I, I think you. it's really cool what they're doing and really empowering women in the music industry. And yeah. I know Beats by Girls is another one. Yes. Um, there's several other uh, collaborating groups out there that of women that are really just growing and teaching other girls in the music industry, which I, I think is great and important. Yeah. I know totally. you've been a big advocate uh, advocate with that as far as a lot of things you do. Um, yeah. empowering women and then also um, a lot of women who are Asian descent as well mm-hmm. in the that's music cool. industry as you are so that's really cool I think Thank um, you. yeah I mean any other words you have to say on that totally open yeah um, I would just say I think like it's definitely a work in progress as far as that goes but I think we're slowly seeing change which is which is great um, a good example of this is I think like you know a number of years ago when I was a student and I was learning about music tech in college, sometimes I would be the only girl in a class of 12. Um, but in one of my classes this semester, for example, that I'm teaching, uh, there's only one guy <laughs> and the rest are girls, which, wow. is, which is awesome. It, it's wonderful. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's in a way also what kind of drives me to keep doing the doll trick stuff and keep doing the teaching too. I feel like we almost kind of gravitate a little bit to mentors who are similar to us. So I'm, I'm not sure if the same situation would have happened if let's say, there was a male instructor and then there would be, you know, 12 women in that that yeah. room. But it's cool. I think also just because of the nature of the way that the, at least from my experience, the way that the field has worked out um, for me is that women have been very supportive of each other. So it's always like, how do we keep getting more women into the field and making, making it look like, you know, it's, it is okay because it is, it's, it's like totally 
fun right. to to be doing music things and music tech things specifically. And and I owe it to so many mentors of mine too, like Aaron Barra, Laura as well. Yeah, um, just, she was on the podcast too. Aaron yeah, was. Aaron, yeah, Aaron's wonderful. I I love Aaron so much, and and she's been like such a role model. I I I told both Aaron and Laura this honestly, but before I even saw them as people, I didn't even know that this sort of thing would be possible as a career. So I totally really? owe it to them. Um, cool. Like, and especially like for coming from, from a background where um, in, for most of the the time that I grew up in Singapore, which is where I'm, my, my family is um, at the moment, it really wasn't a thing at all for people to do music. And then even to be like a woman doing something in music and then specifically music tech, it was just like totally not even an option. So to yeah. have my eyes opened um, fairly late in the game, honestly, like in my twenties when, when I was in college, um, I'm very grateful that I had that experience, but it was just really just opening my mind to all of these possibilities. So very, very thankful that that happened. So yay. Yeah. Well, and I think it's great what you're doing and hopefully, you know, Thank down you. the road, I know that I know for sure you're empowering other women and to make music mm -hmm. and to do other things through your classes. So Keep doing what you do and I think it's really great. And the more we can have diversity in the industry, I think the better it is for everyone. So yeah, totally. Thank you so it. much. We appreciate allies. Thank you, Dan. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Unite together. <laughs> thank yeah. you. It's cool. Well, thank you so much for joining the podcast. I want to respect oh, your time. Yes. And like, this cool. has been super fun. It's always good catching up with other master track friends and Ableton nerds like totally. myself. So this is a good time. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? on social yeah. or wherever totally so it's probably going to be on social it's it, this is maybe also like a manifestation of that introvert extrovert thing that i mentioned to you just now but like i don't really have socials for like myself as claire so the, the, probably the, the best place is just like at daltrick on all platforms so it's like um lowercase letters d-o-l-l-t-r exclamation point c-k um as my name but as handles it's D-O-L-T-R-I-C-K. Because sometimes they don't sometimes they don't allow for special characters. This weird special, yeah. I know. It's like, <laughs> dang it. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. For, for the most part, it's Daltrick on all um, platforms. But if people want to hit me up professionally for, for more of um, like education stuff, then clairemarielim.com is a good place. Or even the Ableton Certified Trainer listings on the website. Yeah. No, I have to thank Google for making Dan Giffen more SEO friendly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Ab Ableton's doing that for me on Google. So appreciate you guys. That's awesome. Thank you, Ableton. Yeah. Thanks, Ableton. Yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Well, this has been fun. Thanks again totally. for hanging out. Thanks I'll for include, having me. Always. Yeah. Maybe we'll have yeah. you again in the future. But everybody totally. listening right now, uh, check out the show notes as always. I'll include Claire's links and all the shout outs she just gave. So go give her a follow, like, subscribe, support her. Thank you. And yeah, let's do this again sometime. Enjoy yeah. the week. Make some more music for yourself. We want to hear it. I will. Thank you, Dan. This is like part two of the therapy I needed. Thank you. <laughs> well, good. I'm here oh, for God. it. Yeah, Dr. Dan. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God, that's the new. That's the new alias. I'll that's send like... you an invoice later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh my God, <laughs> cool. no. We'll take cool. it easy. Have a good Thanks, week. Dan. You too. See ya. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Later. Hey, big thanks to Claire for joining the podcast and definitely encourage you to go check out her stuff. Give her a like, subscribe, follow. Also, if you haven't purchased the latest version of Live 11 software, you're missing out. I would love to save you some money and give you a massive discount. So go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton and check that out. Also, would love to have you join the email list if you want to get the latest and greatest happenings with me as I'm doing future Ableton trainings and events giving away free downloads of racks, sample packs, and getting the latest episodes when they first come out. So go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. Check that out. Also, if you want to step up your skills producing music, would be happy to have you in my membership. Just go to liveproducersonline.com and click the join membership button. It's hella cheap. And I've been updating my Live 11 course, which I have a lot of new updated videos and goodies in there. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the podcast. Much love to Melodics for sponsoring this podcast, and I will see you next time.